Okay, so I hope this screen is visible. Yes, sir. Sorry for the delay. Actually, what happened is my pen was not working, so the very last moment I had to make changes in the PPT. So in this particular class, I will not be writing with the speaking pad. So what I have done is basically I have solved in pen and paper, and I, I have pasted those photographs over here, and I will be explaining through that. Okay. So I welcome you all to this 12th live session on the NPTEL course of deep learning. So this course is provided by Professor Robert Kumar Distress, who is a professor in the Department of uh, Electrical and Electronics Communication Engineering, IIT Kharagpur. So in this particular video, we'll first solve quiz 11, and followed by that, uh, we'll uh, solve the questions uh, some of the practice questions for week 12. In week 12, so we have seen a few topics that have been uh, mostly we have put some thrust over there. So one is we have seen that uh, variational auto encoder, and another one is GAN. And apart from that, uh, GAN uh, Professor PKB has just uh, touched upon, but it is not. Uh, the full description of GAN is not there in that particular video. And uh, let me tell you, GAN is uh, very much uh, mathematically intensive uh, thing. Uh, what you have seen in case of VE, if you uh, remember that in VE, you had to uh, first start with a minimization problem of field divergence, then you got to uh, that minimization problem, then back converted to a maximization problem, followed by that there were several mathematical steps were there. So you can think that GAN, whatever you have seen in case of VAE, in GAN, you will see probably uh, maths, twice of that you have seen in case of just beginning your so GAN is pretty intensive in mathematics. So that is why uh, that GAN part has not been covered fully. So we have just given some glimpse over there in case of GAN. But if you are really interested to read about GAN, you can uh, check the original paper of GAN, which is written by Ian Goodfellow. So that paper is an archive. You can just download and read about it. Okay. So let's jump into the Week 11 quiz. Let me just check names. So, the first question that uh, this question basically tells that uh, which of the following can be a target output for semantic segmentation problem with four classes? So, in case of semantic segmentation, we know that the input image and the output image, they have to be of same shape. So if I just show you one example of semantic segmentation, so you know already, but uh, for the sake of completeness, just. So if this is an image over here, uh, semantic segmentation basically means that you are trying to segment the pixel level entities. For example, if this is a card, this one is also a card, these are buildings. So this basically, uh, gives you uh, four to five class problems so over here. Sorry. So this is a eight class problem over there. So you have several entities like road, then cars, buildings, uh, then you have bushes over here. So likewise, this problem is basically called a segmentation problem. This will speak a semantic segmentation problem. If the uh, uh, If you basically uh, have, uh, if this particular image, but the segmented image, if you would have, it would have been rather, uh, like this, for, for example, this this is a Maruti Suzuki card, and let's let's say this is a uh, Audi card. So if the cars, then in between them, in the uh, in intra class, if there was some variability in terms of the labels, so therefore that that particular segmentation would have been called an instant segmentation. But in this particular course, we will be basically talking semantic segmentation. Fine. 
So you can see that this is this was the input image and this is the output image. So as over here, you can see that this is the MRI image of a brain over here. So which basically shows that you have the white matter over here. These are other tissues over there. And this is the uh, segmented uh, the image over here, which you got after segmentation. So from all of these images, you can basically understand that the input image shape and output image shape should be equal. Then only you will get the exact mapping from the image to the segmented output. So therefore, input and output image should be same, uh, of same shape actually. Now, what is the uh, another thing that you have to consider? That is basically when you segment that particular image. For example, over here in this particular case, you have uh, three classes. One is this. Uh, uh, white matter part over here and they, these are the surrounding tissues are there and these are the uh, uh, say uh, this is called uh, spinal fluids are there uh, cnfs are there so you have three classes so in these three classes you can see for example when you segment this particular image for uh, this particular pixel over here where i'm pointing the uh, my mouse. So in this particular pixel, if you're trying to uh, actually uh, make a segmentation over here, as because you have three classes, each and every pixel element, it will have the entities or the entries of the pixel elements would be a array of uh, one hot encoding, one hot encoding. So over there, you would have an array of three cross one as because you have three classes. And let's say this is class two. This red one is class two. So the uh, arrangement of that particular one hot encoded array would be zero, one, and then zero. So this one basically means that you are now belonging to class two, and that is why you can see that class two basically represented by this red color uh, label. So what? Uh, what is the problem over here in this particular question? In question number one, you can see that the input image size was basically three cross three, but uh, the output image size is also three cross three. But what what is the thing that you have to notice about uh, over here in this particular image is each and every pixel element now is one hot encoder. So over here you can see that for this particular pixel location for this particular location. Here is another entry. Here is another entry. Here is another. So as because you have four classes, you will be having four entries. And the property that you have to consider that is each pixel element will have one hot encoded vector. So one hot encoded vector will have single one. Uh, it will be uh, uh, hot at single place. That means uh, over the whole array, it will be sparse array. First of all, it will be sparse and only one element of that particular one hot one hot encoded vector will be one. The rest of the uh, entities will be zero. So here, from these uh, uh, images, you have to actually understand. Uh, you have to first basically scan through that uh, at what particular location of the input pixel over here. Uh, the one hot encoded vector property is basically not satisfied. So let's first check over here. You can see that let's say, let us consider about the first pixel location. In the first pixel location, you can see zero is here. Then the second one is okay. We got a hot vector over here. That means uh, we got a one. So the rest of the other elements that would that would have to be zero because that is what the property of one hot encoding. Only one element would be one, and the rest of the elements would be zero. So over here you can see again zero, again zero. So that means this is correct. As far as this particular pixel is being concerned, so this particular pixel has been arranged correctly as far as the one hot encoding is concerned. So uh, now let us check for the second pixel location. Over here you can see one. Now, as because we got a one uh, at the first time, so all the other elements would have to be zero. Otherwise. Uh, it will be a violation of the one hot encoding rule. So now the point that we have to notice over here that at the same pixel location, you got another one. 
So over here, it is an anomaly. It is violating the rule of one hot encoding. So that means you cannot have two ones over here. And if I just talk about in other sense, probabilistic sense. So if you sum up all the values, all the entities of a vector, which is basically one hot encoded, the summation will be one as because total probability is one. So over here, you can see that if you just add the values at pixel location two, so one plus one, it is two. So that means it is not uh, obeying the uh, rules of probability as well. So therefore, this is an anomalous case. So you you have found out the, uh, the anomaly. So you just can uh, omit this particular option. So option A is negative. So likewise, we have to check. Let's now check about option B. So in option B, the first pixel location you got zero, one. So rest of the elements would be zero only. So you got zero, zero. So this is fine. So the second uh, element is one. So rest of them will be zero only. So zero, zero, and one. Okay, so again, you got an anomaly at this particular location. You got one over here. Again, uh, you got a one over here. So that means this is a, another anomaly. It is not obeying the rule of one hot encoding. Okay. Now let us uh, check option C. In case of option C over here, you can see that zero, one, zero, zero. It is uh, properly uh, stated over here. Now uh, for the second pixel location, one, zero, zero, zero. So that is also fine. And for the third one, it is zero, zero, one, zero. So again, this is also fine. So this is zero, zero, one, zero. So only uh, one element is basically uh, I have got through not value. So that is one. So that is also fine. So over here you got one. So rest of the elements should be zero. So zero, zero, zero. And over here also, so this is zero, one, zero, zero. And in the last two cases, it is uh, one, zero, zero, zero. So that is fine. And over here, both the elements are zero, both the elements are zero, both the elements are zero, and over here, both the elements are one. So that means at these two locations also, you will got the correct order of uh, the uh, one hot encoding over here. So that means option C is the correct option. As because it is obeying at every pixel location, it is obeying the uh, property of one hot encoding. So that is why you can say that option option C is actually the correct answer for this particular question. So in case of option B, if I just just show you the anomal anomalous place, so that would be over here. So you can see that for this particular location, you got one. And again, at this particular location, you got another one. So that means over here, for the at least for this particular pixel value, you can see that you are getting two ones. So that is basically a violation of the one hot encoding rule. So again, option D is nullified. So any query uh, for this particular question? Sir, one question. From this yeah. picture, how do we know that it's a four class uh, problem? We have to find four classes. Okay. Um, so this, the problem is I cannot show you with pen. So let me try. Uh, so yes, I have written over here. So here uh, it is the same thing. Image in case of image segmentation, we will have input image size and output image size will be of same shape. So the, your question is that uh, how do you know that it is a, a four class problem? So let us consider uh, over here we had three class problem. You can uh, now think that there is another color. Let's say uh, for for the time being, let's say there is another color is there that is yellow. So th now this has become a four class problem. So this is fine, right? You have four colors, so that means it's a four class problem. Now, when you when you uh, create the uh, let's say image segmentation problem, so this is this is the uh, you can consider you are feeding uh, MRI image over here. So this is a raw MRI image that that you have seen, and over here you are getting the segmented output and as because you have four different classes, so you will have four different colors. So it was like uh, this. Now let's say uh, you want to uh, segment this particular pixel, right? 
So the input image shape, this if I write it is R D cross T. So output image shape will also be R D cross D. And now you are trying to segment this particular pixel value. So what we have just told is that over here, for example, if you try to segment this particular pixel value, this particular pixel value to indicate that this is a four class problem, it has to be one hot encoder. And how many classes are there? Let's say it is a four class problem. So how this pixel value will be arranged over here? So it will be arranged as one. Let's say I'm uh, there is no uh, I'm using no notion to put one at any particular place. I'm just randomly putting one at any of the places. So one zero zero and zero. So at each and every pixel location, at each and every pixel location, the value will be arranged like this. Okay, so it will be like your input size was four cross four. Your output size is also four cross four. But at each and every pixel location, you will get another one cross four vector. So that is a one hot vector. So I think till this point it is fine that how uh, uh, at each and every pixel location you will get the values. So to segment this particular value, let's say this uh, this belongs to class two. So over here at this particular location, you will get another array of one cross four size, which will basically a one hot encoded vector. So that is why and as because this is belonging to let's say class number two. So therefore you will get one over here. So first tell me whether at this till this point it is fine or not. Then I can yes, proceed. Okay. So now you till this point it is fine. So uh, we can see that at every location over here also at this location also you will get another array of one cross four. Now this is as far as you uh, how you basically arrange data in Python. So as far as coding is concerned or in real uh, implementation is concerned. So we basically write it like this way. The image size will be same and inside the image there will be another one hot encoded vector. So at each pixel location there will be another four one cross four data at each every local each and every location there will be another one cross four data. Now in this particular problem you can think that your input image was of size three cross three. So as you can see the output image is also shape three cross three. But why then why do you have these four copies over here? This is just due to in in uh, as far as numerical questions are being concerned. They they would have written it like this. They would have written it like this. For example, they, they would write a three cross three over here, three cross three image patch over here. And at each and every patch, they would have written the one hot encoded vector. So instead of writing like this, they at this particular particular location, they could have written like one comma one comma zero comma zero. Okay. So instead of that, they have <coughs> written it in this way that uh, they have uh, created uh, separate separate masks and they have put each and every value at each of these masks. So over here you can see that this one is placed in this particular mask. This one is placed over here. This zero is placed over here. This zero is placed over here. So this is analogous to this thing that you just write a single three cross three patch over here and within that particular patch in each and every pixel location you either write it in this way. Otherwise for the sake of uh, simplicity and just to illustrate the problem in a better way. So they have written, they have written this, all these things in a separate masks. So whenever, as because you are asking that, how will you be able to understand whether this is a four class problem or not? You check at, let's say you fix this particular pixel location. In this pixel location, you see that how many entries are there. 
so over here you see one entry another entry another entry and this is the fourth entry so then you will understand okay that means at this particular pixel location i will get four values that means there are four classes in this way you can understand that whether this is a four class problem or not fix one pixel location and then check that how many entries are there over here the entry they have made wrong because they had to uh, uh, make some incorrect options so you cannot get one over here you, you you should get a zero at this particular place then only it will be a one hot encode and vector but other than that you just fix a particular place and then check that how many entries are there on that particular place itself so you can see that this is the first entry second entry third entry and fourth entry which basically tells you that there will be four classes Thank you, sir. Okay. okay. So let's go to the next question then. So this is the next question. So the next question actually basically uh, talks about the dice coefficient. So uh, what is uh, what is basically meant by dice coefficient is basically this is a uh, uh, coefficient that basically tells that if you have two vectors, how those two vectors are overlapping with each other. If there is a high overlap, for example, if uh, if I just uh, talk about talk with uh, the Venn diagram. So let's say this is this is one scenario. This is one scenario. And let's say this is the final scenario. So over here you can see that these two sets are partially matching with each other as because this, there is a partial uh, overlap in between these two sets. So the dice coefficient would be in between 0 to 1. And these are the two extreme cases. So let us consider that my image is not the proper, but anyway, if I just remove this particular thing. So you can consider this. This this black line is also a circle itself. So this is one uh, extreme case where you can see that there is no overlap. So therefore, the, this is a representation of null null overlap. So therefore, your dice coefficient would be zero. And this is one extreme case over here. You can see that both of them are overlapping with each other. So therefore, the cardinality will be maximum and the cardinality uh, basically meant by uh, generally it is meant by this thing uh, within two, it's a mod of A, but it is also uh, referred as cardinality. So uh, then, then the cardinality will be maximum and it will be equal to uh, 2 into A, B divided by A plus B. So over there it will be 1. So these are the extreme cases. Either your dice coefficient will be zero or the dice coefficient will be one at two extreme cases. And in between, so this is an in example of in between dice coefficient. Let's say the dice coefficient over there in this particular case, it might be, let's say 0 0.4 over here. Now, how to calculate the dice coefficient? So I have written the formula over here. So the dice coefficient formula is if you have two vectors, or two uh, images or whatever you have. So it is two multiplied with the uh, cardinality of A intersection B divided by cardinality of A plus cardinality of B. Now over here, cardinality is also defined as that uh, number of one bit. So in many cases, in case of dice coefficient, whatever uh, uh, formula that have been given over here, 2A intersection B cardinality divided by cardinality of A plus cardinality of B. So this is a standard definition, but uh, let me tell you, as far as problems are being concerned, you maybe it have maybe it it would happen is that uh, you might be given a different definition. So for example, in this particular case, you can see that mod A is number of one. Bit. So it is basically that non-zero elements uh, that they are referring to. So um, uh, for these kind of question, for dice coefficient kind of question, even though you know that what is the meaning of this uh, 2 into A intersection P is cardinality, 
but it is always better to check that whether they in the question itself they have given any definition of definition of cardinality or not. So over here you can see that they have given a modified definition of cardinality. So you have to abide by this particular definition. Otherwise your answer uh, will be wrong. So in case of A, uh, how many number of uh, ones are there? So how many ones are there? So we can see that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can see that mod A is seven. And in case of B, one, two, three, four, five. So you will get five over here. And now you have to you have you have found out that mod A, mod B. Now you need to find A intersection B's cardinality. So A intersection B is. What you can refer to it is. A multiplied with B and then you take the cardinality. And over here cardinality definition is number of one. Bit. So you multiply A with B. So for example, this is A and this is B. So one into one, this so the first element is one. Zero into zero, second element is zero. So in this way, you will get this particular string. And in this particular string, how many ones are there? So you can see that one, two, three, four. So a total number of four ones are there. So you can see that we have found out each and every uh, component of this particular equation. So you just plug in this equation 2 into 4 divided by 7 plus 12. So it will give you 0 0.67. So 0 0.67 is basically the current answer. This was quite straightforward. Now uh, let us go to the next question. So the next question is also uh, upon dice coefficient only. So in case of dice coefficient over here, you can see that mod A, they have given different uh, definition. So the mod A now it is defined as sum of all elements. So what you have to do to calculate mod A, so mod A will be uh, summation of A, I or all I. So mod A can be determined like this. So you have to add all these things over here. So this is basically the mathematical representation. So if you add all these things, you will get 7.82 as the final total uh, of mod A. And then in case of mod B, it is quite straightforward. So you have 4 plus 4, so total 8. Then the next thing is you need to find A intersection B's cardinality. So over here, the uh, A intersection B is basically meant by you multiply each and every element of A and B. For all I, first you do the multiplication, element wise multiplication. That means 0 0.01 will be multiplied with 0, 0 0.03 will be multiplied with 0. And likewise, you can see that 0 0.89 will be multiplied over here, 0 0.85 will be multiplied over here. So you do the multiplication and then you will get a resultant a resultant vector or resultant matrix and then you add all the values over there. So that is basically meant by the okay, sorry, this cardinality is actually the summation. So as per the definition over here. So A intersection B and then you take cardinality over here. So you will get this particular equation so summation over all I and then you do the multiplication in between all the elements of A and B, and then you will get uh, the cardinality form. So if you do this particular uh, operation, then you will get the total summation value is equals to 7.4. And then again, you just plug in all these equation, all these values over here, so, and uh, the final answer will be 0 0.93. So let's move to the next question. So the next question is you have a 1D signal. So that 1D signal is basically X of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So these are the elements of that particular signal. And you have a filter as well, that is F. So the F or the kernel has four elements, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you need to perform stride to 
transpose convolution. So you need to perform strike to transpose convolution. And then uh, what they have said that you don't have to perform the cropping. So we know that uh, we do cropping at the uh, middle point of the uh, um, kernel, but over here, as because we have chosen the uh, even point filter, then in most of the cases, we actually uh, use odd point kernel rather than uh, even point kernel. Uh, even point kernel. So over here, as because we have used even point kernel, so they have said that you don't have to perform cropping operation over there. So now let's proceed with the uh, uh, what you call the transpose convolution. So you keep your signal over here and keep your uh, kernel over here. So you can see that one, two, three, four I have written over here. Then uh, you go to the next next signal element position. At this position, you have to remember that there is a stride to uh, definite. Uh, they have defined that you have to do stride to transpose convolution. So stride to means that you have to shift your kernel by two unit. So we have shifted the kernel by two unit, and then we have placed the kernel uh, accordingly. Then again, go to the next signal position. So you get to the signal position, and again you just uh, make a stride to shift. So over here, we just have shifted by two unit from the previous uh, location of the kernel, and then we are we have put the kernel accordingly. And likewise, you do the same operation until you get the end of the original signal space. So at this particular location, it will be the final uh, placement of the kernel. So now you have placed the kernels uh, accordingly. Now it's time to do the multiplication and summation, and that is when you will get the final convolution output. So over here, the first output will be one multiplied with one. So you will get one over here. At this particular location, again, two will be multiplied with one. So you get two. Now uh, at this location, F2, you can see that there are two contributions are coming from two different places. One is from this particular place, from this, sorry, from this place, and another one is from this place. So over here, you, what you have to do is three multiplied with one plus two multiplied with one. So three plus two, it will be five. So if you just carry out the whole thing, uh, you will get this particular representation. So the final uh, outputs will be one, two, five, eight, nine, fourteen, thirteen, twenty, seventeen. 26, 15, and 20. So if, uh, for the sake of completeness, when you go to the last final kernel location, over here, the final output will be 4 into 5, 20. Over here, it will be 3 into 5, so 15. In the uh, third last location, over here, it would be 4 multiplied with 4, 16, plus 2 multiplied with 5, so 10. So 16 plus 10, it is 26. So over here, we can see that uh, this is basically the correct option out of all these four. So the fourth option is uh, basically got hidden uh, behind this particular image. So the next question uh, actually states that uh, which of the following is true for semantic segmentation? So in case of semantic segmentation, uh, let, let's just scan through the options. So option A says that semantic segmentation can be considered as pixel-wise classification problem. So that is true. Over here, we can see that uh, all these pixels are being classified as whether the pixel belongs to car class, or it is a road class, or it's a building class, or it's a bush. So that means in case of classification, in case of vanilla classification, what we had is basically we had a we, we used to feed an image, for example, an image of cat, and then at the output, the classifier will tell me whether the whole image belongs to cat or dog or not. However, in case of semantic segmentation, we'll feed an image, for example, this particular image, and then instead of classifying that whole image, in this particular uh, uh, semantic segmentation problem, what it will do is it will rather classify the pixel level entities. So over here we can see that all the pixel positions have been classified to a particular class, whether it, uh, it could be a road class, car class, it could be buildings, or it could be bushes or something else. So this is a pixel level. 
classification rather than uh, uh, what we have seen previously, that is the whole image classification. So semantic segmentation is a pixel level classification. So option A is correct till this point. So the second option is uh, semantic segmentation output has the same dimension as the input, input dimension. So we know uh, this is a pretty uh, straightforward uh, statement that uh, we already have seen that input image shape and output image shape or the segmented image shape should be same. Otherwise, you cannot map the input image to a segmented output. So that is why option B is also correct. Now let's see option C. So option C basically tells you that it has an application it has an application in autonomous driving, industrial inspection, and medical image analysis. So I have uh, uh, shown three different cases. So this is an example of aut automatic uh, uh, self-driven car. So in case of self-driven car, we, uh, if you consider that you are uh, riding on a self-driven car, so the car should look into uh, its Till, till the horizon that, that it can see. So over there, it has to see that uh, how many cars are there? Is there any pedestrian is there or not? Is uh, uh, buildings are there or not? So this is basically the autonomous driving uh, car that basically uh, sees through the camera. So there, there are cameras placed over there in, the, in, that particular, in those kind of cars, and the cameras actually continuously collect pictures or videos and that video is basically semantic, se semantically segmented into these kind of uh, segmented outputs to understand that what is just uh, before that particular car or what is there uh, in the behind of the car and what are uh, there in the sides of the car to understand its possible prediction whether uh, to take particular uh, to, to take any sort of action. So this is an application of autonomous uh, driving. Second option, second, uh, you can see that uh, this example basically belongs to a medical image segmentation. So we have an MR image over here, and this particular MR, MR image has been segmented uh, into three particular classes over there. One is uh, the CNFs, these are the blue parts of the CNFs, and uh, this uh, green part is basically the surrounding tissues. And over here, this is basically tells you that what, what, what sort of uh, uh, gray matter or white matter over there are present in the uh, MR image. So this is an example of medical image segmentation. And the last uh, uh, example that you have is basically this. This is called a crack image segmentation. In many of the industries, in the civil industries, so they use these kind of uh, new automated uh, uh, cracks, uh, crack segmentation methods by which if you just show it to any RCC structure, so it will basically tell you that uh, what uh, it, it will first give you the, uh, the semantic segmentation of the cracks, and then uh, you also have to they what they also have to do is basically depending on whatever crack it basically sees, they also try to predict that uh, what is the severity level of that particular crack, whether that crack is basically very severe. Maybe it can cause a fatal uh, uh, consequence. Uh, otherwise, it can also uh, classify that particular crack into a less severe case. So you just can uh, do some sort of re-concretization, and then uh, it, it would be uh, okay as what was there in case of previous case. So this is another uh, example for the industrial ex uh, um, inspection. Over there, you see the uh, crack uh, images of the RCC structures, and then it will tell you that uh, first it will tell you that where the cracks are present, and then uh, it will also tell you that what is severity of that particular crack. So over there, option C is also correct. So in these particular uh, areas, uh, semantic segmentation uh, has been uh, doing pretty good work. So, as because all three of all three options are correct over here, so you can we can say that option D, that all of the above options are correct. Sir, in the previous question, yeah. Uh, sir, how the cropping is working? If here it is, then we no. don't perform cropping. If actually, cropping. actually, we do cropping when we use the odd. Odd kernel. So let me tell, tell, let me show you that how we do cropping. So 
let's say you have one, two, three as the uh, image, uh, or let's say it is the signal. And you have, let's say, one, two, three, four. And you have the uh, kernel, which is of one, two, and three. So, and let's say you are doing again uh, strike two operation. So, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's difficult to write with mouse. Okay. So you got the first output. Second. Third. Then this is fourth. This will give you the fifth output. Sixth output. This will give you the seventh one, eighth one, and ninth one. So generally what we do is basically for when we choose this kind of odd kernel, so this you can see that odd number of elements are there. And in this particular case, you have even number of elements. And in case of deep learning, it is very rare that we, in examples also you, you would have seen that in many cases, the kernels are uh, of shape three cross three, Or it is of five cross five. So like that seven cross seven. If you see the ResNet paper, ResNet uh ResNet 18 paper. So they initially have started with seven cross seven, then followed by five cross five, and then later on they have used some other kernels as well. So when you use the uh what number of kernels over there, then we do cropping. And where we have to do cropping at the center of the Final location. So this is the first signal entity location. And at this particular location, you, you have to start cropping from this particular position. And at the last uh, signal location, you again need to check that where is the uh, center of the kernel basically lying. So after that, you have to do cropping. So you need to consider the outputs from this point to this point. Generally, we don't take the uh, uh, what you call even element based kernels. And if you choose even element based kernels, we don't do uh, the cropping operation. Otherwise, what we do is basically we crop the first and last element. In case of KDAS, they basically do this first and last element cropping. But in case of this particular, uh, these kind of operations, what we can see in case of the odd element kernel, is so what there we you we crop at that particular location where the kernel center basically lies on so what here we can see the kernel center is lying on at this particular location at the first instant space and at the last uh, location of the input signal over here you can see that kernel uh, center is lying over here so you need to crop your signal from this point to this point you will be considering this point to this point so in this way we do cropping so, sir, in this question, there is no need to write that if we don't perform cropping because there is even no, number no, of. No, no, no. Okay, so thank you. As because they have written as because in the uh, in general sense we do cropping and in the lecture also Professor PKV has shown that how uh, they do cropping. So it is just to. Uh, ensure that student did not get confused that in the lecture the, he has done cropping and over here how to do cropping because you cannot decide the center position over here because it is symmetric one two three four it if it would have been a odd case you can define a center but over here you cannot define a center over here. So just to avoid confusion that is why they have explicitly mentioned that you don't have to perform the problem. And generally we don't consider these kind of filters as well. We always prefer to have odd filters.
So the next question states that in a deep scene and architecture, the feature map uh, before applying max pool layer with two cross two kernel and with a stripe two is given below. Okay, so you can see uh, that two cross two stripe will be like this first. Uh, max pulling mask will be placed over here. The second max pulling mask will be placed over here. Third max pulling mask will be placed here. And the final mask will be placed at this particular location. Thank you. Now, uh, with this uh, structure, if you do the max pooling, so the max pooling output I have written over here. So in this particular uh, location, the max pooled thing will be 30. So this is the highest value. So I have written 30 over here. Then at this particular location, the highest value is 14. At this particular mask area, the highest value is 5. And over here, the highest value is 19. Now, in case of max unpooling, what are the two uh, results that we need from pooling layer? So, you do max pooling, sorry. So, you do max pooling. In case of max pooling, you'll just get an output like this. A two plus two output you'll get. But when you do max unpooling, what is the extra thing that you need? Anyone? Anyone? In case of max unpooling, what is the extra thing that you need to perform the unpooling operation? You get the max pooled output, and what is the other uh, variable that you need? Yes, anyone? We need two entities. One is basically the max pooled output, and zero. we need no, no, not zero. One, we need a max pooled output. So that is what we are getting from those particular mass 30 is the highest value. So I'm putting 30 at that particular location. So that is the max pooled output or this half sampled output. And we need some other matrix. We need some other matrix which basically stores some location information. What is that matrix called? Switch parameter. Yeah, so we need those switch variables or switch parameters. So that particular switch variable, what it basically retains is that it retains the information that from which particular location you bought that highest value from those uh, max pool masks. So over here, when you write 30 at the max pool output or the sub sample output, so this is the sub sampling output or the max pool output. You also need to retain the information that from which particular location you got that particular highest value. So this 30 is located over here. So in switch variable, you will correspondingly you will make an entry that at this particular location you will put one, and every other location which basically belongs to that particular mask, so this black mask, it will be zero. Similarly, when you do the max pooling operation in this particular mask, so for this particular area, you take 14 as the highest value. So as you write over here, you write 14 as the highest value. You also need to see that from which particular location you got that highest value. So over here, you can see that the highest value is residing over here. 
So you put a one over there and every other location that basically comes under that particular mask or this green mask, you put zero at every location. Fine. In this way, over here for this particular area, the highest value is five. So as we have written five and the five is residing at this particular location. So one will be placed over here, rest of the values, which is basically coming under this blue marked region, every value will be zero. And in this the, the, the last position over here, so the highest value is 19 and 19 is residing here. So I have put one over here and every other value which is coming under down uh, this particular mask area. So every value will be zero. So now we got this half sampled output or the max pooled output and we got another output. So that is basically called the switch variable, which basically retains the information of location from which you got the highest value. Now you use both this information, that is the max pool output and switch variable to create a max unpooling output. You feed the, both the information to the max unpooling layer and then max unpooling layer will give you the final result. So when you do the max pooling, what happens is that you had a four cross four. You had four cross four matrix. Your size is reduced to two cross two. But in case of max unpooling, what it basically does is it tries to extrapolate the information or it tries to upsample the information. So to upsample the information for two cross two, It has got the max pooling output as 2 plus 2 and the switch variable. So the switch variable is basically denotes the original size of the uh, input matrix that was basically inputted to the max pool layer. So the original size is 4 plus 4. So now when the max, max unpooling layer sees that the switch variable size is 4 plus 4, then it got to know that my output shape will also be 4 plus 4. And how will I uh, place the values? So wherever you got one, you put the corresponding max pool output value. So over here, you got a one at this particular location, and this one basically corresponds to this 30. So you just put 30 over here in the max output, max unpooled output. Similarly, you get Basically, every value in this particular area will be multiplied with 14. So as because 0 into 14 is 0, so every other place it will be 0 and over here it will be 1. But over here also you got a 5 at this particular location and this 5 basically refers to this particular mask area. So you multiply 5 with all the values over here. So you will get 5 at this particular location only as because in every other place as it is 0, so 0 multiplied by 5 is 0. And same thing will happen here. So the last uh, kernel uh, mask area is basically this one, this unmarked area. So over here 1 is there, so 19 will be multiplied with 1, so you will get 19 over here. So this is the final output that we get from the max unpooling layer. So max unpooling layer basically needs two input. One is the max pooled output or the subsample output, and another is the position information, which is basically stored in the uh, switch variable or switch parameter. So over here we can see that option C is the correct answer. So any query? Sir, one question. How is it going to work for uh, average pooling? OK, uh, uh, this particular max, there are two operations that we do. One is basically the uh, max. So you can see that this is this layer itself is max. Unpooling. So this layer basically works with max unpooling only. And what happens in case of average pooling, if you have done average pooling, why we don't prefer average pooling uh, in case in, in these particular uh, semantic segmentation problem? This is because, for example, 
you have uh let's say let's say i'm writing this particular thing over here so you have certain values here so 2 30 14 and 12 and when you do average so this average value will be placed at this particular location so the, when you will do average what will happen is that you can see that you got a high value over here these are the moderate values and this is uh, a small value so this particular due to this particular small value what will happen is that all the values will be smeared down so the average value will be dropped will drop down and what basically averaging means averaging means that basically you are losing the information of the uh, um, high frequency information or the detail information so you might have heard this, this detail information term uh, in the first video of this week of 12th week so you got to know that these skip connections that we use these are basically to retain the information of the uh, what you call detailed info uh, this basically this skip connection what it ensures that you basically retain the detailed information and if you do max pooling as your subsampling process at the first time itself you are uh, basically smearing down all the detailed information because you can see if you just take an average over here the value will be dropping down so that is why in majority of the cases you will see uh, max pooling is the only uh, pooling or subsampling method that is basically used in case of segmentation and that is why uh, for that only we got this max unpooling limit it is not like average unpooling there's nothing like average unpooling max unpooling layer is there so you need to retain main thing is that in case of semantic segmentation you need to retain the detailed information so that is very much important or in case of image denoising also, you need to retain the uh, detailed information of an image because detailed information uh, is very much important for an image. For example, it will contain the information of edges, boundaries. What will happen if you just put an average filter? If I, I just tell you, you can do it by yourself also. You take a, take any image in MATLAB, you take any image and you do low pass filtering. So low pass filtering, what it will do is basically uh, it will smear down everything from that image. So you'll get something bloody image. Uh, and in, if you do the uh, uh, high, uh, high pass, uh, if you pass through a high pass filter, so what will happen is that your image will be sharpened. So in case of uh, deep neural network as you can see that over here when you do the convolution operation along with the uh, subsampling layer your spatial information gets decreased down and when you get a very small spatial information spatially decreased output from this particular output what we have to do we have to again reconstruct the original image so this becomes very difficult and if you do uh, the average pooling. So anyway, your detailed information are at the first time it is gone. So it is very difficult to retain those detailed information. So that is why in most of the cases we see that max pooling is only used and corresponding to that you will get max on. Uh, okay, sir. So the next question is. Uh, so which of the following operation reduces the spatial dimension of the features? So already we have seen max sampling. What it basically does is it's it's a up sampling process. And upsampling process means you have a very smaller uh, uh, feature or receptive field. And what it basically does, it basically extrapolates that receptive field and it makes it bigger. So that is what we have seen over here. You, you had this particular max pooled output. 
you got that switch variable which basically retains the information of the location where you have to put those values but from the 2 plus 2 input you get a output of 4 plus 4 so that means it basically increases the size so it basically uh, so it basically increases the size so over here, the question is which basically reduces the reduces the spatial dimension. So over here, we can see that the spatial dimension it was initially two cross two. Now you got a spatial dimension of four cross four. So therefore, uh, this option is nullified. Then you have two cases. One is pond three cross three, and again another thing is the transpose convolution. In another example. In this particular example, we did transpose convolution with stride through. So over there, we we see that initially our uh, input size was x. Uh, x had five cross one, but uh, in the output we can see that the size is pretty elongated. So what there in case of transpose convolution also, the size is used to increase the uh, spatial dimension. So if I just show you this particular operation as well, you can see that this is the standard convolution that you would be at the encoder side. And now at the decoder side, you can see that the size is gradually increasing. So this is basically where you do the transpose convolution. And if I just ask you, uh, can you remember that we also had used transpose convolution in uh, one of our coding classes as well? So where we had used the transpose convolution to increase the uh, special width of the special uh, dimension of the image. We had used transpose convolution in one of our uh, Python coding session. So where we had used transpose convolution. We had used this particular function earlier as well. Even before knowing this, that what uh, this uh, transpose convolution basically uh, do. We had used it somewhere. So if you remember, it is basically we had used uh, for image denoising task only. So uh, image denoising is basically taught in this particular week's uh, lecture. Uh, uh, basically using convolution, how you can basically uh, do the image denoising operations. So we uh, did one exercise on uh, Convolutional autoencoder. So, pawn autoencoder we performed. Uh, we did experimented with those, and over there, specifically, we used our architecture that was basically known as uh, convolutional denoising autoencoder. So, there we had used this con transpose convolution at the decoder side to increase the size of the uh, uh, size of the feature map. And finally, at the end, the input image and output image were of the same shape. And we had used transpose convolution there. So I have uploaded the codes in my GitHub profile. You just can go and check from there as well. So now we have to scan through whether option B and C, which one is the correct one. So for that, uh, let us just check options, uh, option C over here. Uh, which basically it is 3 plus 3 kernel size, stride is equals to 1 and padding is equals to 1. So we know that output dimension of convolution operation is basically given by this particular formula. So we have considered that image size, input image size is x cross x cross 1. It could be a grayscale image. Otherwise, it could be a RGB image. So that is why I have written cross 3 as well. But x cross x basically denotes the spatial dimension. And this three basically denotes the channel dimension. That how many channels you have. If it is a single channel image or basically image, so then there will be multiplied with one. 
basically cross one, you can omit that particular notation as well. Otherwise, if you have uh, RGB image over there, so you will be having cross three, which basically signifies that you have RGB channels. Now, in this particular setting, let us uh, consider uh, the output dimension can be governed by this particular equation that is input image size minus kernel plus two into padding divided by stride plus one. Okay, so uh, let us just plug in all these values. So kernel size is three, so that is why I have written three over here. Two into padding, so padding is one, so uh, plus two, and stride is equals to uh, one. So that is why you divide it by one and plus one. So if you just uh, do the manipulation, also it will you will get that output size is also x. So you started your uh, calculation or convolution operation with x cross x. That was the special dimension. At the end also, at the end of the whole convolution process, you can see that input dimension is equals to output dimension. That means there is no reduction in special dimension. So. Option C is also modified. Now let us uh, see what option B basically deals with. In case of option B, we have stride two. So accordingly, I have just written the. Uh, I have just plugged in all the values. So x minus three, two into one. So that is basically the padding. Uh, uh, padding is equal to one. So x minus three plus two and divided by stride. So stride is two over here, and then you put a plus one. Now uh, you can see that it is x minus one divided by two plus one. Now let me ask you a question. Let's say x is equals to two two four. Then you tell me what will be the output dimension. Have you got the question? When you do all this manipulation, you will get x minus 1 divided by 2 plus 1. So till this point, do you have any confusion? Like till this point? 1, 1, 2.5. Okay, so answer is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2.5. Okay. Yes, sir. How come it is? This for x we have to substitute 224. Yeah, two, so we will get 4 minus 1, 223 divided by 2. So it will be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 5. 1. 5, 5, plus 1. Plus 1. So you get ah. 1, 1, 2.5. But uh, yes, sir. In case of image dimension, have you ever seen such kind of dimension? It is either let's say two to four cross two to four, one one two cross one one two. Have you seen that one one two point five something like that? The dimension is one one two point five into one one two point five. No. No. So that means. This equation is missing something. And we solved this particular these these kind of scenario in uh, week 10's quiz. So what 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 is it miss, that is missing in this particular equation? You have written everything that is fine, but there is some extra term or extra operation that is missing over here. What is that particular term? Floor operation. Yeah, floor operation. So what you have to do, you have to incorporate floor operation. So then instead of getting one one two point five, will be dragged down to one one two. Anyway, this is not related with the uh, question that we have been asked with, you can directly see that there is a significant uh, reduction is happening. You had 
224 cross 224 dimension now you are getting 112 so that means eventually you are uh, reducing the spatial dimension but i thought of asking this particular question because anyway your exams are coming when is that particular exam is scheduled i think they have given you the dates as well Twenty seventh, sir. Twenty seventh. Okay. So you have one week to submit this this last quiz, I think. So when is the due date for this particular week's quiz? Seventeenth, sir. Seventeenth. Seventeenth. And exam is on twenty seventh. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether they will allow us or not, but I thought of keeping one session in which I will be solving that last quiz, quiz only, not other than anything but the quiz. So I will ask NPTEL if they allow me, then I will take. Otherwise, I can just write down the solution and I will upload uh, in the G drive. So. Uh, in G drive link also, I think you guys have, right? Yes, uh, sir. In main so, yeah. so from that G drive link, uh, you can get the last solution as well, last quiz solution. As well. If they do not permit us to take class for that last quiz, then uh, I will just uh, solve that particular quiz in pen and paper and upload in uh did you try it so so the next question is uh, you have the face net and uh, why the l2 normalization is layer is used over there in case of face net so in face net you this is a uh, architecture of face net so you feed uh, image of a face. There is a CNN network is there, and the CNN network. What it does basically from X, which is basically of dimension D plus D plus three, it basically creates a one-dimensional embedding vector. So this is basically what is uh, illustrated as Z. So Z is belongs to R. Uh, let's say M cross one. And initially X was of shape R D cross D cross T. So this was the input image set, and that is this is what you get after the embedding has been generated. Now, after you get this embedding, this embedding is basically uh, generated from a linear layer. Now, in case of linear layer, there is no restriction about whatever value it can generate. It can be anything. So there is no specific range of the data that is being generated at this particular location as because you are getting the output from a linear. Now we put another layer that is the L2 normalization layer. So L2 normalization, what it basically does is it normalizes The output like this. And as because I have told you that Z is a uh, M dimensional element, so Z has elements like Z1, Z2, Z3, dot, 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 ZM. So then, then only you can say that Z is a M dimensional uh, vector. So you can write it as. M cross one. And just tell me that what is the uh, role of a normalization layer? In general, why do we need use normalization technique?
we have dedicatedly studied about normalization. So why do we mean we basically use normalization technique? Sir, for overfitting and underfitting. Not like overfitting and underfitting. Dimensions of all images should be equal. No, that is also that is also not true. Uh, one one thing is uh, uh, in case of transform, transform yeah. the your uh, uh, features, all the features on uh, very you know like say, same similar scale, so that you yeah. Don't, Yes. Yeah. One is one is this one. This is this is correct. That we, for example, uh, why I was saying that this particular lay, this particular output or this particular embedding has been generated from a linear limit. So there is no restriction that the Z1 could be 1 million, Z2 could be 1, Z5 could be 500. So there is no restriction in the value that Z basically receives from that particular linear limit. So if you use these kind of vector for further processing in deep learning, it is very likely that the final result will be biased to the high value. So in case of deep learning, this is very common problem is that if you have in an array, if you have very high value, the result will be biased to that particular uh, high value. So to transform every value on a same scale or to visualize every value on a same scale, we do the uh, normalization, uh, we use normalization technique over there. So there are several kind of normalization techniques are there. For example, uh, one normalization is basically mean max normalization. In case of mean max normalization, whatever value you, you have, uh, that will be mapped in between zero to one because the equation is x minus x min divided by x max minus x min. So over there, uh, the uh, value will be ranging from 0 to 1. And the reason is pretty intuitive. For example, uh, when x becomes x minimum, then x min minus x min will give you 0. And when x becomes x maximum, so the term in the numerator and denominator, they will be same. So the final value will be 1. So in this way, every value is basically uh, scaled in between. 0 to 1 in case of mean max normalization. Now, so now uh, uh, in case of L2 normalization, what we do is basically what why we have used this L2 normalization over here just to restrict every every value that it basically receives from the linear limit. So we put a con constraint over here that will do Z ones, this is the L2 normalization process. Say two square over here, and then dot 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 dot. There's M square over here. Okay, so this is the L2 normalization, and what we basically uh, put as a constraint is that you do this whole operation that will be equal to one. So whatever value it may have, it has to set, it has to satisfy this particular formula that root over uh, and as because. There is a square is there as well, so you can put a square over there. So effectively, summation said i square for all i will be equal to one. And as because there was a root over and again there was a square, I just have omitted that particular part. So this is what the role of this algorithm normalization layer that we use over here in FaceNet. Now, uh, just tell me if this Z, if this uh, this is an n-dimensional element, let's say M is equals to three, then the equation 
will be simply Z1 square, Z2 square, and Z3 square will be equal to 1. So from here, uh, can you just uh, infer something from this particular equation? What kind of shape you can get from this particular equation in three dimension? You have three dimensional array and you get Z1 squared plus Z2 squared plus Z3 squared is equals to 1. So what sort of uh, So what, uh, what sort of uh, figure that we can uh, refer from this particular equation? Let's say it was n equals to 2. Let's say z was a two-dimensional vector. Then you would have written z1 squared plus z2 squared equals to 1. Then what? What kind of shape you you will get? Circle. Yeah, circle. Yeah, circle. And in case of three dimensional, uh, in, yeah. in the three dimensional case, it will be sphere. Okay. But uh, in general, in deep learning, uh, this m value is obviously greater than three, and it is not just greater than three; it is greater greater than three. It could be 128 dimensional, it could be 1024 dimensional. So in case of three dimensional case, in case of two dimensional, it was circle. In case of three dimension, it is uh, sphere. And beyond three dimension, we call this particular shape is a hypersphere. So what we ensure using a bad to normalization layer is that the output will be scaled in such a way that the summation, the this operation will give you equal to one. And in a way from this equation itself, this basically suggests that every point or in the every point in this particular Z, uh, Z array, it will be mapped to a hypersphere. So that is why uh, the option A is the correct answer. That is to constrain the embedding function. So we are putting a constraint over here. So this is L2 normalization technique, but we are putting a constraint that if you do the L2 normalization and you take a square, the summation will be equal to one. And this summation will be equal to one. That particular formula basically refers to a hypersphere kind of architecture. So that hypersphere is basically, if I consider that this is a, a M to be D dimensional, as because they have referred with D dimension. So if let us consider this is not an M dimension, it's a D dimensional element. So you can consider that for three dimensional, this was a sphere, but for any dimension greater than three, that would be called a hypersphere. And as because we are dealing with d-dimensional space, so it will be d-dimensional hypersphere. And now let us talk about the other options. So that why other options are not correct. So for regularization of weight, anyway, it is not uh, related with regularization of weight. We are not applying any constraint on the weights. We what we are doing is basically we are getting an embedding. On the embedding itself or on the output itself, we are applying the normalization. So there is nothing uh, to deal with the weights. So therefore, L2 regularization, it is not at all relevant for this particular operation because we are not putting any constraint on the weight values. Then option C is for getting the sparse embedding dimension. Again, uh, L2 normalization has nothing to do with sparse sparsity. So we have seen in our last um, class itself that L2 normalization or L2 regularization, those things uh, does not uh, ensure that you will get a sparse representation. So over there, this particular option is also in, this is also incorrect. So option A is the correct answer. So any query? So 
So the next question states that uh, what is the use of skip connection in image denoising tasks? So in case of uh, so for that I have I just have taken a figure which basically employs the convolution deconvolution based architecture as well as the skip connection. So the problem at hand is we have a noisy signal or noisy image so to say, and what we have to do is the output side our expectation is basically to get a clean image out of the noisy image. So we'll feed a noisy image over here and we we, we, we try we intend to get a clean image over here. Now uh, at this particular condition you can see that you also employ the skip connection at every uh, uh, step. So over here you have a subsampling layer and from the subsampling layer, we basically go to a uh, upsampling layer or the max sampling layer to, to basically contribute the detail information. And we already have told that how detail information is basically necessary in these particular cases the, in the image restoration cases. So what happens is that we also have seen in a uh, few uh, illustrations in the uh, weeks lecture as well. So there was a image of uh, butterfly. So when you were not using the uh, skip connections, so what was happening is that uh, the detailed informations were, were not passed. Uh, what was there in case of initial or the shallow convolutional layered outputs. So as because those detail informations were not passed to that particular region, so therefore your output from the decoder part was also kind of bloody. And when the moment you introduce the convolution, uh, the skip connections, so what happens is that at the shallower layer, the convolution uh, output basically contains the information of the edges, high frequency information, and those are also called the detailed information. So these detailed information are directly passed through this skip connections. So it is basically creating an identity mapping over here, and this is basically added with the output of the max unpooled layer. And this is how you get a sharpened output at the at every location, and which basically helps in to uh, get the final output of the decoder as a crisp image rather than getting a bloody image. So now let's scan through the options. So option A is basically helping deconvolution layer to recover a improved clean version of image. So that is uh, basically another job. So you feed a part signal over here, which is basically part with let's say AWG or additive white Gaussian noise. So that Gaussian, uh, that noisy signal you feed here and at the output you try to get a clean signal. And what happens is that when you do the convolution operation, so as the convolution operation goes along, so the uh, convolutional kernel basically tries to learn something which basically ensures that at the convolution receptive field or the output of the convolution, you get some uh, denoised information. And subsequently, that is passed through these uh, upsampling or transpose convolutional layer, and such that you get the final output, your final output as a clean image. So at this particular stage, the neural network basically tries to learn some information by which it can create the denoising uh, features. So that is why it is true that it helps the deconvolution layer to recover an uh, improved version of the clean signal. And as well as it basically passes through the detailed information, which is also basically highly necessary to create the good uh, restored image. So back propagation of the gradient of the bottom layer, which makes training easy. So we already have seen in case of ResNet architecture. For example, if this is uh, on layer, then you have cooling layer. Then again, you have on and pulling layer. And you do a skip connection over here. So over here, the addition is happening. So at the time of back propagation, so the gradient can either can flow through this particular path 
Now there, as because you can see that there are convolutional layers and pooling layers are there, so it has to update the weights at this particular location. Now what what would happen is that if your model is too deeper, you might face a problem that is called vanishing gradient. Over there, when the gradient might get vanished, and as soon as your gradient is vanished, your learning process will be stopped as as far as the uh, gradient descent rule is concerned. Now to avoid or to alleviate this particular problem. What we can do is we can pass the gradient to this particular layer as well, and we can pass the gradient from this particular layer. So what will happen is that in this particular path, as because this is creating an identity mapping, over here there is no layer is present, no con layer, no nothing is present. So in this particular line, the gradient will be untouched. So therefore, when the gradient will meet over here, even though the gradient is kind of dying at this particular location or vanished at this particular location, when it will surpass this particular area, it will see that another component of gradient is coming over here and that is basically added. So again, the gradient will be uh, the gradient at this particular location will keep as it is, or it, it would be intact rather than getting died uh, by using the uh, vanishing gradient method over here. So this particular identity mapping or this keep connection based path basically helps you in back propagation as well as because it basically uh, alleviates the problem of vanishing gradient at the time of training by providing a bypass way for the gradient to pass uh, in the backward direction easily. So therefore option B is also correct. So in case of option C is uh, to create the direct path between convolution layer and the corresponding mirror deconvolution layer. So you can see from the figure itself. So this was the convolution layer. It is basically uh, going to the corresponding mirror uh, deconvolution layer, and this basically creates a path over there. So this is pretty straightforward. So option C is also correct. So as you can see, all the options are correct. You can choose option D to be the final answer. So this is the last question for uh, week 11's uh, quiz. So the last question states that what are the different challenges uh, in one uh, challenges one face while creating the facial recognition system? So one challenge could be over here. We can see that there is a prob there could be a problem of illumination. So over here you can see that this particular area and let's say this particular area rarely it has some illumination. Mostly it is dark. If you take histogram as well, uh, I I hope you guys know histogram uh, as because histogram is also uh, uh, discussed in our previous classes, probably in week one when we were dealing with the feature extractions. So what they are, we had extracted histogram. So uh, over there, over here we can see that uh, the uh, most of the images are rarely are hardly illuminated. So this could create a problem while doing the uh, face recognition system. So barely you can understand that whose image uh, is this one. The second challenge could be uh, different pose. So for example, for a single person itself, uh, you can see that one can take photos from different angles. And the moment you take your photos from different angle and which is which has not been seen in case of the training set, then your face recognition system will get a hard time to classify or to identify that this particular image belongs to whom. whom. So this different pose uh, challenge is also there in case of uh, pose and facial orientation. So we can see that the facial orientation is also different. So in one image, it is looking at the she's looking at the right side, another she's looking at the left side uh, on the ceiling probably. And over here you can see that the pose is changing. So she's smiling over here. So over here also the orientation of the face is also changed. So these are some uh, challenges that you might face while, do, while creating official face recognition system. And in any deep learning problem, the uh, challenge, this is a prominent challenge that limited data set for training. 
but still we try to find some ways to uh, tackle this particular problem. It is not like that we don't we have very small amount of data, so that is why we cannot uh, train a deep learning model. We need to find some other mechanisms by using, let's say, some learning mechanisms such as one shot learning or by using augmentation. We need to employ some techniques by which we can actually train the models, but still limited data set for training. It's a prominent issue. So all these options are correct and I have referred to papers. If you wish, you can read these papers. So both these papers are basically uh, basically deals with limited training data. So you can refer to refer to these papers. So these are also available in archive itself. So you don't have you don't need any actual subscription or something to download these papers. And even though if you are not able to download, you just uh, you can tell me you can mail me. I uh, I will send you the papers. So in this particular case, option D will be the final answer. So any queries so far? Okay, so I hope it's not ready. Okay, so let's move to the practice questions for week 12. So in week 12, majorly we focused on some of the applications of deconvolution layer based operations such as image demoising. Uh, we can do image dehazing as well. We also have seen some of the applications of semantic segmentation over there. And after that, uh, uh, the main topic that we have covered is basically the variation or autoencoder. The variation or autoencoder is basically a class of neural network, which is also known as the generative neural networks. So over there, uh, in previous cases, we were mainly uh, concerned about classification, regression kind of tasks. So now uh, here our aim is basically to generate new data from uh, previous set of data from, from the original set, can we create new set of data or fake data which have similar property uh, as the original data? So that is why this is called the generative neural network architecture. And VAE is basically one of the primitive architectures uh, in uh, generative neural network architectures. So we need to find that which graphical model basically fully represents the variation autoencoder. In case of autoencoder, we have seen that autoencoder tries to uh, code or uh, uh, tries to encode any data into a latent space, and from that latent space, it tries to again regenerate the data itself. And there is a data loss associated with that, which is basically has to be minimized uh, over the epoch. Now, in case of additional autoencoder, the main difference is that instead of getting a single point or a very, uh, deter very deterministic point for, a, uh, for each and every dimension of the uh, latent space, we try to get a probability distribution. So what the probability distribution will do is basically rather giving a single data output, it will give you the uh, mean and standard deviation of the uh, probability distribution, and you can generate new uh, latent vectors from that. So over here, I have just written that this is the encoder part. The encoder will be encode uh, will be giving you this mu and sigma, and using the uh, normal distribution with zero mean unity variance, and by using this mu and sigma, you can generate new z's or the latent vectors. In previous case, in case of simple vanilla autoencoder or the traditional autoencoder, so there these z's were kind of pretty deterministic. There was no sub there was no sampling process was involved uh, while creating these latent vectors. Now in case of additional autoencoder, the main difference is that you got to uh, access about two new factors, those are mu and sigma, 
which basically gives you the parameters for the probability distribution. And then you can sample any sort of data from this particular distribution, mu and sigma, and using the normal distribution with zero mean and unity variance, then you employ uh, sampling process and you get a Z and then subsequently you can feed the data into the decoder architecture to get a new sample that is X hat. So this is what ZAE looks like. So what you are doing is basically you give an X to try to generate Z. So the, in terms of probabilistic view, we can say that this is, there, is, there will be a function Q which will be represented as it will create Z given the input vector X. So its job, the decoder's job is to create a function Q, which will give you output Z given the input X. After that, when you get the mu sigma, you will get a new sample Z from the normal distribution with zero mean and unity variance. Then you try to create a uh, decoder architecture so this decoder architecture, what it will do is it will try to create another function that is P and its job is to create X or X hat given the. Uh, so over here it would be, I have written it incorrect. So this function would be P. Its job is to create new sample X given the input vector to this particular decoder. And here the input vector to decoder is what? The latent vector. So that is Z. So we can write in, in a uh, computational graph architecture. So over here, if I just write X and Z, so the conversion process is first starts with the encoder part. So the encoder's job is to create a latent vector Z through a function Q given the input vector X. Then upon you get the uh, latent vector, you try to generate a new sample X. So through uh, you try to get a new sample X. So what we are, you just refer to this particular form. So given this particular uh, latent vector, given this latent vector, you try to generate X through a function, through a decoder function P. So this is the computational graph architecture that we can refer for any variational outline problem. Now let us see that which one is the correct one. So you have X and you try to generate Z out of X using a function that is Q and which basically represents the encoder. Then when you get Z, you try to generate X back. So given Z, you try to generate X back using a function P, which basically corresponds to the decoder architecture. So that is why option A is the correct option. Rest, you can see that these <laughs> computational graphs are incorrect. These are partially correct, but uh, as because we know that in case of variational auto encoder, two steps are involved. One is the, the encoder part, another is the decoder part. So as far as encoder decoder architecture is concerned, so over here you can see that this particular computational graph is basically representing the correct one. So this is uh, uh, easy one. So you can see that this is a vector algebra uh, kind of thing. So let us consider this is vector A. This is vector B. And this is vector C. So by vector algebra, we know that C and as these vectors are placed, so C is equals to A plus B. Now we need to find that what is this C actually basically means about. So over here, A represents that man without hat and B represents the information of hat. So in case of variation autoencoder, what we can do is basically we can generate new samples. So if you give some information, let's say you can, you are basically in, you are basically uh, encoding the information of a man without hat and you are adding another encoding in, encoded information that hat. 
information of hat. So these two, when it will be combined with each other, it will generate a sort of new image. So over here you fed an image where the person was not wearing any hat. Over here you fed an image. Over there, there was only hat. So let us consider this is hat. And the over here the person is not wearing hat. So when you use these two informations, what will happen is that it will try to extrapolate these two informations such that you will get a person who is actually wearing hat. And same kind of illustration you probably have seen in the week's lecture as well. There was a Barbie doll and a fish and variational autoencoder tries to map uh, map those inputs in a intermediate space. And that intermediate space was a magnet. So same information that you can refer from here as well. You feed the information of man without hat and you feed the information of hat so that at the resultant output, what will happen is that those two information will be fused with each other and you can get an image where a person's face will be there and he or she might be wearing a hat. So it would be man with hat, not woman with hat, because you didn't say any information about woman, because your input data itself was a, a image of a man and image of uh, this hat. So the output option will be so the final option will be man with hat. Okay. So this is the last question. So uh, which of the following is an invalid activation function inside a neural network architecture? So we've been given three different definitions of the activation function. So let me ask you people that you can see the question. So please tell me that which one is the invalid activation function? And why? Sir, B. B. Okay. Anything else? And why? Uh, this is for me. Why B? Sir, because first one, I think it is the ReLU uh, where we take the maximum. It is not exactly uh, uh, the daily equation is max 0, x. So this is max 0, 2x. It is kind of ReLU, but it is not exactly what ReLU, ReLU looks like because ReLU has unit slope over here. You have to slope of two. So uh, option B, uh, first one is let's say almost equal to ReLU. So what is wrong with B? What is wrong with beef? So we need to maximize the input and uh, minimize the error. So here they are minimizing the uh, the input itself. So I think the minimization function is a problem. This is just an activation function. For example, for example, let's say tan inch. Over here, you can see Stanich is standard activation function. So I hope there is no issue with Stanich. So Stanich is valid activation function. So do you have any problem with Stanich or do you think that Stanich is a valid, valid activation? The tenet is valid because it is actually another another uh, form of uh, this uh, sigma. Sigma, yeah. So it is basically transforming the data. So if you put an x over here, if the for example, if x value is very low, it's just a function. 
it is not minimizing anyone. You put a value X and let's say your X value is very, very low. So it will map the value. The output value will be almost equal to minus one. Right. If you just plot this particular function, this max 0, 2x, it would be this, then this, and this slope will be 2. And uh, just tell me that what will be the shape of this particular function? What will be the shape of this minimum 0, 2x? Okay, so this how does it look like? Yes, anyone. You just have to plot the graph. That's it. So, is it uh, inverted parabola? To get a parabola, you have to have x squared term or y squared term. Then only parabola is parabola can be generated. If you can tell me the definition of the function also, that will also be fine. Please try it out at your end. Is it exactly same as leaky delu? Uh, okay, uh, just tell me that uh, what it is going to look like in this particular half. In this first quadrant and fourth quadrant, how does this particular function looks like? Around positive x, it's going to be zero. Yeah, it will be zero. And what about the negative? It's going to be just the inverted. Uh, yeah. yeah. And what would be the slope? That should be two as well. Will there not be a minus sign? Yes, negative. Yeah. So from the flow itself, you can uh, uh, you can also see that in this particular area, in this particular figure, you can see that these values are increasing, and over here, as you go along, these values will be decreased over here. So there the 
uh, slope will be with plus two, and over here as the values are decreasing, you can say that the values are only plus two. And otherwise, you can also compute using point by point is point by point y two minus y one divided by x two minus x one. So now my next question to you is, uh, you guys have uh, read about thresholding function. Uh, you guys have seen threshold function, right? Yes. So just tell me that whether threshold function can be used as an activation function or not. No, no, whether no, why that is correct. We cannot use threshold function as activation function, but why? Because the derivative is not yeah. good. Yeah, because the, because derivative is not uh, derivative does not exist over there. So to choose any activation function to be valid or invalid, we have to check that whether the function that is that you are getting here here or here, are they uh, differentiable or not? In case of uh, um, thresholding function, the thresholding function can give you a sort of activation because uh, either you get zero or you get one or whatever threshold you put. But the thing is that the moment you think about the activation function, when you do the back propagation, the moment you do back propagation, you have to take differentiation of the activation function, as you have seen in case of back propagation or back propagations lecture series. We did several problems on that. So the uh, crucial thing is that you have to see that whatever uh, whatever um, activation function you choose, that has to be differentiated. And as because this resulting function was not different, it was non-differentiable. So that is why we cannot use it as activation function. Now, in these three cases, can you comment that which one is differentiable, which one is non-differentiable? In these three cases, one is tan h, one is this one, this max one, and one is this mean. So please tell me that uh, do you think that uh, any one of them is actually a non-differentiable function. So I think all are differentiable. Here. Yeah, all are differentiable functions. So that means there is no invalid activation function. So not, none of the above will be the correct answer. So this is a very uh, prominent concept that we have to use. Uh, just because minimum is written over here, you, can, you cannot say that it is minimizing some value. It is. It has nothing to do with minimizing or maximizing. It is just a function that you have to see. You have to plot it down, and then you have to see that whether the function is differentiable or non-differentiable. If the function is differentiable, then it is good enough to be chosen as activation function. If the function is non-differentiable, then you can say that, OK, this is not differentiable. So when we will do the backpropagation, so then we cannot differentiate the activation function and hence the as the differential the differentiation is not existing, then you cannot do that del L by del W. So you cannot compute del L by del W there and hence you cannot do the back propagation, you cannot do the learning. So you have to be cautious about while choosing the activation function. The only single point you have to think about that whether the function is differentiable or not. So using that concept, you can see that none of the error is the correct answer. And let me tell you in the exams, probably you might see some, even you may not see something very straightforward questions. Questions will be easy, but they will be, uh, you, you have to uh, be pretty sure about the concepts that you, that you're going to use mm -hmm. while uh, writing down the final answer. You have to be conceptually correct. 
so you can see this particular uh, thing in the activation function weeks lecture so i have taken the previous question uh, just to check that uh, whether you can recall those uh, concepts or not so okay so with this if you have any further query i can answer otherwise we can stop the session here So today is the last uh, lecture, sir. Probably today is the last lecture because this live session is for 12 weeks only. So this is the B12 session. And if they allow us to take one extra class, so that will be anyway, every time I take, uh, the classes are for two hours only, but I take more than two hours, sometimes three hours also. So the last class will be of one hour, but they have not intimated us anything about we have given a slot, but uh, we don't know that whether they will allow us to do it or not. If they do not allow, then what I will do is I will upload the answers in the G drive, and then you can access those answers from there, as well as the uh, reasoning will also be there. Otherwise, so the NPTEL answer. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Sir, so there is one class announced tomorrow. Not sure if that's yours. Five one class. Seven. One class announced tomorrow. Yeah, I think just now got the okay, let me just see. Probably in the course. He also forgot that what slot I had given. That's the issue. Because in my institute also exams are going on, so I also forgot that what are the dates. You got mail, right? Yes. Yeah. And another thing I will request you if uh, time permits at your end, uh, you can also uh, fill out the uh, feedback forms as well that you can see here. This hardware of problem solving sessions you can feed you can uh, put a feedback for both the TAs. Because it's a great opportunity for us also to receive the feedback. Then we can also improve some of the things that you might think that it has to be improved. So overall, yeah. to be frank, this course was so uh, informative and you know, like uh, it was very, very uh, good lecture, sir, I think. Uh, so overall, I think I'm, of course we will be filling the feedback form, but uh, if it is the last lecture, then I want to uh, thank you, you know, for your time and uh, you know, like it was very, very. Every week we are looking forward to your session, sir, because it's very so much information and you are. I think one of the advantage uh, in you is I think the way you come in, uh, like you know, put forth the ideas and uh, you know the, the thing are very nice. So thank you so much for uh, this. I, I echo the same, sir, uh, you know, same, same feedback. It was really great to see you in action. Uh, I have attended a lot of other classes, right? So every other uh, teacher or the lecturer I saw, they just want to finish off this stuff. But it wasn't the case with you. You really ensured that everyone understood the concept before you moved on. So really appreciate that. If this is the last lecture, uh, I think we are going to miss it. Anyway, probably next semester also I'll be taking any other, probably some other course. So uh, probably if your area also matches, you can also join. But I also don't know that which course I will be opting for because in each semester they give us some different courses. So uh, I generally take the signal processing course and uh, deep learning based courses or machine learning to some extent. Uh, so if your area also matches, then we can agree. Meet over here as well. Absolutely, sir. Looking forward to that. Yes, sir. Looking forward. So I think I have to mail to NPTEL because I also forgot that what is that exact date I had filled.
यस 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 इट विल बी बाई मी या बिकॉज दिस पर्टिकुलर आईडी इज ऑफ माइंड या सर टुमारो फाइव टू सेवन दैट विल बी a session okay so they have put two hours slot okay so no issues sir for feedback form for 12 ah. weeks you have to as it's up to you it's up to you you can fill one weeks or you cannot uh, if you don't want you, you, you can leave that as well so it, this is not mandatory so that is why you receive those mails that if you already uh, i filled this sir But you told me now, so I'm asking for every week. Oh no, no, it is not. It is not mandatory. It is not mandatory. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. sir. So, because of you, I also learned something about deep learning, and it's useful for my research work also. Yeah, yeah. Because this now particular like course is uh, really helpful because this is a foundational course. If you see any papers regarding deep learning or something, or let's say if someone of you basically works on theoretical side of the deep learning, then also you'll see that theoretical papers of deep learning are pretty maths maths intensive. And this in this course itself, Professor P K V has brought down different various difficult concepts at very ease. He has explained, so that will also uh, a very great thing about this particular course. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, is there any advanced deep learning course apart from uh, this? Uh, advanced deep learning course. There are other courses are also there because uh, from IIT Kharagpur itself, Professor uh, D Sheet. So uh, Professor D Sheet's course is also there. That is also deep learning for computer vision. Uh, that is also twelve week course, but. Uh, in that particular course also you will see several aspects and there probably you might see some coding stuff also but i don't know in this in the coming semester that course will be floated or not but that course is good uh, that is i think deep learning for computer vision uh, another one is taken by that is quite advanced uh, according to me that is advanced uh, that is professor uh, professor mitesh khapra so it is also under the banner of deep learning so probably iit roper and iit uh, sorry iit roper and uh, uh, iit madras so that particular course was conducted by these two iits so that course is good uh, basically what i mean mean by good is uh, the more the course get advanced the use of mathematics or the uh, derivation that you see that will become more intense over time so for example the same thing uh, when you go to uh, in this particular uh, deep learning uh, lecture series you have not seen a special kind of architecture that is called uh, recurrent neural network so in case of recurrent neural network you will see different mathematics will go on for example when you do time Uh, back propagation that will not be a simple back propagation that will be bptt so back propagation in time so new mathematics will come so in these sort of courses you will find new uh, some other informations as well and there are some other courses are also there uh, distributed learning using tensor flow or something so that course is also advanced course so you can refer to those things you can go to nptel's website nptel.ac.in and then you can search uh, you just put a keyword deep learning and then under the banner of deep learning you'll see multiple courses floated from electrical department uh, computer science department in some cases from biology department in iit guwahati there is a course floated by the biology department that also deals with deep learning also with very good uh, information thank you sir okay okay so we can end the session here
Friday class tomorrow. Yeah, uh, Hello, from sir? five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Tomorrow there will be. Yeah, tomorrow there will be class from five to seven. Session from five to seven tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow there will be a session by me, and later probably the other TA he might take class. Probably, uh, yes, he will take uh, one class, one or two class. But tomorrow the session will be of mine from five to seven. Okay, sir. okay, sir. Thank you, sir. No, sir. Really, uh, you taught uh, very nicely, and uh, you cleared the basics also very properly. It was Testing the classes. So and uh, you have given the uh, practical idea also. Yeah. So later on, if I found because for the research, I need this topic, uh, deep learning. And uh, if yeah. I need any help, can I mail to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, no problem. OK, sir. OK, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. One, so, one, one, one request thank maybe you, sir. I think it will be request or uh, you know, yeah. uh, because since you are very good at you know teaching this uh, the deep learning concepts you know with uh, uh, very uh, effortless manner, uh, please continue to make uh, videos sir. Apart from the classes, like you make your YouTube channel live and it, all. You know, it, it, like, is, it uh, is very difficult. I I thought one once I thought of doing this. But it is very difficult because I have to do my research. I have to take classes here also in the institute. Yeah, I mean, and after 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 your research and once you have found some time and if you are, if you want to, let's say any topics you can choose and you know like you can make presentation or whatever that because your 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 teaching is very easy to grasp and you know like very easy to learn, and I'm sure people like me who want to learn deep learning and definitely will find your website very useful, sir. I think that 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 is one request maybe <laughs> possible. Uh, surely I, I also thought about it, but when I will get time, I will I'll try to do that. Thanks, sir. Thank you. OK, so I'm ending this session here. Thank you, sir. OK.